Hi, it's Dr. Centeno. Uh, this is a lecture that I gave at Stanford University. Uh, it was uh, an invited lecture through their Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, which is part of the Department of Orthopedics at Stanford, on why interventional orthopedics will be the next interventional cardiology. So I'd like to share that with you uh, as it was delivered at Stanford. So obviously Stanford is located in the disruption capital of the world, uh, Silicon Valley. And medicine is mostly innovated in fits and starts, but is not often really truly disrupted. So let's take a good example, cardiac care. Now cardiac care is one area of medicine that has been truly disrupted. Uh, in fact, when I was in residency, uh, way back when in the 1980s at Baylor College of Medicine. At that time, pretty much every 50-some-year-old guy that I admitted had a big sternotomy scar, and that's because he had had open heart surgery. Now, fast forward uh, quite a few years, uh, a few too many for me to admit, and open heart surgery is very rare. Why? Because interventional cardiology really diverted Th uh, hundreds of thousands of patients over the last uh, several decades from open heart surgery to getting procedures that are performed through a needle or percutaneous or floated through a catheter. So what disrupts orthopedic surgery? If we had to predict what will really change orthopedic surgery for good, it would be it, things that you can inject or what we call injectates that can facilitate healing, high levels of expertise in delivering those things to all parts of the musculoskeletal system using uh, advanced imaging guidance, and the ability to do things that are currently only done surgically, but through a needle to anchor, cut, reshape, all through a needle under imaging guidance rather than through arthroscopy. And in fact, I would tell you that already the first two are dramatically changing orthopedic care. So I'm going to make a bold prediction. And like all bold predictions, this may be absolutely incorrect. But I think bold predictions are important because they are what disrupt things. So hence, by 2030, half of all elective orthopedic surgery will be replaced by interventional or non-surgical orthopedics. Now, based on your specialty, there are a couple possible reactions to this statement, right? Um, if you are interventional spine or non-surgical sports, you're like, yeah, that could happen. If you're another specialty, you may not even know what to make of that statement. It seems so foreign. And if you're an orthopedic surgeon, you're probably, this guy is absolutely a nut job. So again, like all bold and disruptive predictions, this one could be correct, somewhat correct, or completely, absolutely wrong. So what is my regenerative medicine timeline? How, how did I get involved in all of this stuff? Well, way back in 2005, we started the world's first IRB approved cultured mesenchymal stem cell study for common orthopedic issues. And then we started treating uh, patients with cultured mesenchymal stem cells and bone marrow concentrate. Uh, we published a number of MRI case series. Then the FDA uh, came in and said, hey, we think culture expanded cells should be a drug. Uh, so we switched from using that here in the US to uh, PRP or platelet-rich plasma and bone marrow concentrate or a same day stem cell procedure. And since then, we've published a lot of stuff and treated patients in a registry right around 2015, 2016, reached 10,000 marks, meaning we had a registry where we were tracking patients and we got to that point where we were tracking about 10,000 patients. So that was a big milestone. Uh, we began our first bone marrow concentrate randomized controlled trials a few years back. And uh, our research group uh, just uh, early last year was at 40 sites. Now it's at 65 sites in the US. 
And we got to our first randomized controlled trial uh, on knee osteoarthritis. Uh, and we got that published just recently. So more on my background. Uh, I've published about 25 peer-reviewed publications in this area. And we have a privately funded university style stem cell research lab, clinical research team, and biostatistician as part of our Colorado headquarters practice. And we're tracking about 20,000 stem cell procedures in a nonprofit registry. And we now have 65 sites across the US and six international. So this is where the data is collected and this is where we have our sites. All of this is headquartered out of Colorado. Uh, as you can see, we have quite a few sites in the US, uh, Alaska, India, Europe, um, Australia, uh, Asia, with more coming online uh, really every month. So what is interventional orthopedics? You know, I've talked a little bit about it. I've talked around it. Uh, but what is it? Well, you know, right now, if you go to an orthopedic surgeon, you're likely to get a simple intraarticular injection. That is, put the stuff somewhere in the joint. Most of that's blind. Sometimes uh, a few orthopedic surgeons have learned how to use ultrasound or some of the folks that work for them know how to use ultrasound, but it's just basically get it somewhere in the joint and call it good. That is not interventional orthopedics. So interventional orthopedics is, stands between that and surgery. So that's interventional orthopedics, meaning getting into very specific structures and interventional orthopedics is very difficult. If you were to start today and you knew how to inject a knee with, uh, under ultrasound to just get into the joint, and you were gonna try to learn all 90 interventional orthopedics procedures, it would take you hundreds of hours of your time to just be able to learn them, not to master them, but to be able to learn them all. So this is, for instance, putting cells into uh, one or both bundles of the ACL under C-arm fluoroscopy, or it is under ultrasound, getting into specific rotator cuff tears, or getting into a uh, slap tear, or getting into uh, a specific labral tear, all under image guidance. So again, if we had to come up with a definition, uh, Interventional orthopedics is orthobiologic injectates that can facilitate healing of bone, tendon, ligament, muscle, or cartilage. It's precise placement of those injectates into damaged structures using imaging guidance. It's increasing use of percutaneous tools that allow the manipulation of tissue. So these are examples of interventional orthopedics. This is a patient I treated who had uh, a bone marrow lesion, which is the bright stuff in the patella there uh, against the dark bone on the MRI in the lower right. Uh, and you can see an 18 gauge microtrochar being placed under x-ray guidance to inject stem cells directly into that area. Uh, or in this case, under x-ray guidance, injecting the ACL bands, anterior medial and posterior lateral under fluoroscopy, because you can't do this well under ultrasound. Or in this case, uh, injecting the shoulder superior labral anchor for a type two labral tear. Now you can do this in some patients under ultrasound, but most would require a combination actually of ultrasound and fluoroscopy to do it well. Or in this case, uh, injecting with a little 30 gauge needle around the median nerve, uh, platelet growth factors to get rid of the need for a carpal tunnel release. So very, very precise work that takes a long time to learn. So what isn't interventional orthopedics? Blind or palpation guided injections or adding orthobiologics to traditional surgeries. So orthobiologic injectates, uh, right now, we can do things like uh, inject bone marrow concentrate, which is a same day bone marrow stem cell procedure, uh, platelet rich plasma, fat grafts or microfragmented fat, uh, cytokine enriched serums. In the future though, we're gonna have a lot more options. We're going to have culture expanded, allogeneic and autologous mesenchymal stem cells. We're gonna have stromal vascular fraction, uh, other stem and progenitor cells. 
recombinant growth factors, exosomes, etc. So what will be certain is that the complexity and the expanding ability of things you inject to heal tissue will get better and better, which is one of the engines that will drive this transition from surgical to interventional orthopedics. So what tools and procedures are available in 2019? Uh, we've got traditional needles, fluoroscopy, ultrasound. We have steerable needles. We have micro trocars. We have regular trocars. We have ultrasound assisted percutaneous tenotomy, percutaneous discectomy, percutaneous carpal tunnel release, percutaneous arthroscopy. So a lot more is being developed, but I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. We are going to see an explosion in the number of tools available to do things non-surgically. And I would uh, suggest to you that everything that can currently be done surgically today, by 2040, will be able to be done through a needle under imaging guidance without surgery and without arthroscopy. So let's take a quick detour because at this juncture, if you're an orthopedic surgeon, you're probably saying, huh, this guy still sounds a little nuts to me. So these are the most common objections I hear from orthopedic surgeons. How could this stuff heal a torn ligament or tendon without surgery? That just doesn't make sense to me. And all of this has limited applications because you still need to fix the structural problem. So the structural model of pain is dead. And I'm just going to give you a couple of studies that have been published that support this idea. So in meniscal surgery, structural pathology is not related to pain. Now, that would be the opposite of what most orthopedic surgeons would tell you. Um, we also know that these meniscus tears that we've been chasing for years and years, we've spent billions operating on them. By the time you get to be 35 or 40 years old, they're as common as wrinkles on your face, and they are not generally associated with pain. Meaning, if you've got meniscus tears on your MRI, you cannot state in large studies that those patients are the ones with pain. Interestingly enough, shoulder pain after rotator cuff surgery is not related to whether or not your rotator cuff heals, but in fact is related to a chemical level in the synovial fluid in your shoulder. And when it comes to back pain, interestingly enough, things like disc degeneration or emotic changes after a disc herniation are not associated with pain but in fact, a chemical in your blood, an inflammatory chemical, is what determines who still has pain and who doesn't have pain. So we have a neurochemical mechanical model of pain, meaning at the end of the day, uh, its structure has a component here, but there's a nerve component and there's a chemical component, and regrettably, in orthopedic surgery, we've been focused on one third of that equation. We have ignored the other two thirds. And in fact, I'm hoping that regenerative medicine forces us to understand that the mechanical piece is only so important. But in fact, if you add all of these together, the neuro and the chemical piece are equally or more important than the structural piece. So to end this detour, as you'll see later, some regenerative orthopedics techniques will work through structural repair, and we can see that on MRI, but some are gonna exert their effects through chemical or neurologic means. And I would argue to you, it doesn't really make a difference at the end of the day, unless you've got good randomized controlled trials showing that, uh, that ignoring the structure is something you do at your peril, then we need to push the reset button on this concept that structure is everything. So what do we inject uh, today? Uh, this whole category is called orthobiologics. So that can be things like growth factor or cytokine enriched serums, uh, bone marrow stem cells, micronized adipose tissue, 
extracellular matrices uh, that can come from things like amniotic tissue or porcine bladder, uh, and concentrated platelets, platelet-rich plasma, different types of platelet lysate. So lots of different things can be injected. And if we look from a 30,000 foot view at all this stuff, you've got platelets that have growth factors, which are like espresso shots for the local repair cells to kickstart healing. We've got cytokines that are the natural chemical messengers uh, or actors. For example, A2M is a cytokine that can get rid of inflammatory chemicals that destroy cartilage. And we've got stem cells that are like general contractors that can direct other cells to repair tissue damage. So why do we need interventional orthopedics, right? I mean, surgical orthopedics seems to be doing pretty good. Uh, you would be wrong if, if that was your conclusion. So this is a uh, interesting uh, editorial in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. And really this journal and the British themselves have led the revolution as well as some of the Nordic countries in starting to look at critically whether or not orthopedic surgery is really living up to the risk that it uh, exposes patients to on a day-to-day -day basis. So this author, this academic author discusses that only 20% of orthopedic sports medicine procedures that are done every day, paid for by insurance every day, are actually have at least one large randomized controlled trial to support that they work. In fact, I would argue that there's many research studies that show that many orthopedic procedures do not work. So let's, let's go down that road a little bit. Orthopedic surgery grades. So these are the grades uh, that are very similar to, to grades of research that you might see out there. Um, and I've added in a new category, what I call F. And F is that that procedure has been shown to be ineffective in clinical trials. So as we look at orthopedic surgeries, this is what we see. We've got things like uh, knee debridement um, for osteoarthritis that gets an F. It's been shown to be ineffective. We've got things like partial metastectomy for things like no arthritis, arthritis, uh, and mechanical symptoms where you have a meniscus tear. Multiple large randomized controlled trials, this gets an F, but it's still done every day. Uh, TKA or knee replacement for knee osteoarthritis. Now this either gets an A or an F. Um, it might get an A because it has one randomized controlled trial that seems to show it's effective. But the problem was the number to treat was five to six to get one patient who reported that they were 15% or more functionally better as a result of the procedure. And three and four patients by the end of a year who had been randomized to physical therapy chose not to get the procedure. In addition, there's a large cost-effectiveness study that shows that this is not cost-effective in most patients. Uh, again, you'd have orthopedic surgeons arguing all day that that's not correct, that this is a great procedure, but I didn't, I didn't put together this research. Uh, rotary cuff repair with decompression, uh, full thickness rotary cuff tear with impingement, uh, a meta-analysis of RCT shows uh, that it's an F, Rotary cuff repair, full thickness, uh, rotary cuff tears. A meta-analysis of RCTs, again, shows an F. Lumbar fusion for degenerative disc disease, again, gets an F. So as we discuss this, I'd like to focus on a few areas where we use interventional orthopedics. Uh, we'll talk about knee and osteoarthritis, shoulder rotary cuff tears knee ACL tears, uh, some, and some spinal applications. So total knee arthroplasty, AKA knee replacement. So can we replace knee replacement? All of these outcomes discussed here used a very specific protocol of very high dose bone marrow concentrate with leukocyte poor high dose PRP. Not something you can do with a machine, you generally need a lab to create this type of uh, bone marrow concentrate. 
So these are just some uh, outcomes from our registry, and this is uh, quite some time ago when we looked at this back in March of 2017. At that point, we were tracking about 6,000 knee procedures, uh, 3,450 of those had knee OA as the primary diagnosis, and about 13% ended up getting a knee replacement despite getting a bone marrow concentrate injection. Now, this is not just, again, slap it in a knee and go, which is what a lot of orthopedic clinics are doing. This is precise interventional orthopedics going after specific issues in that knee. Now, even if the rate is double this, or even triple this, because this is a biased population of patients, uh, meaning that they didn't want a knee replacement to start with, uh, this is still pretty darn good in uh, reducing morbidity in that population. Uh, so this is some of our published and ongoing NEOA research. Uh, so we actually have a 840 patient uh, case series that we published, and we have a registry-based dosing study using specifically our protocol that showed that we had a minimum dose to get the best outcomes. So before we get into the knee uh, osteoarthritis randomized control trial data, I pulled right before I came here the data from our registry. Now this represents about 6,300 patients currently. That's more than 10,000 procedures for the knee because many of these patients are getting bilateral procedures. And this is the uh, lower extremity functional scale data or LEFS um, showing that we're beating the MCID or min, uh, minimally clinically important difference uh, on function for the LEFS, which is nine. So long story short is uh, the data looks very good. It means that patients are increasing function out to four years. Now this is our knee randomized controlled trial that just got published. It was about 50 patients crossover with physical therapy at three months with a one-to-one -one allocation. And as you can see, using the standard orthopedic scores, uh, we're seeing uh, dramatic improvements in the treated group versus the physical therapy group. Uh, and again, this was a randomized controlled trial. We're also involved in a knee osteoarthritis microenvironment study. So again, we're taking this stuff extremely seriously. We have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars and years on this study, and it should be done in about a year. And what it allows us to do is to take a very small sample of the synovial fluid from a patient's knee, initially analyzing 25 cytokines and growth factors. Uh, now we're up to 440 cytokines and growth factors that are analyzed. And from that, using neural network to make a prediction as to whether or not that patient is a good or a poor candidate uh, for the bone marrow concentrate procedure to treat knee arthritis. And this is the output model showing which cytokines seem to be the most important. Now, this is one of the early models. Uh, this obviously changes as we add more and more data uh, to the data set, but it just gives you an example of the kind of things we're looking at. So rotator cuff repair. Uh, so with rotator cuff repair and with ACL uh, treatment, our focus is on a band of patients that we can treat. Uh, and the, that band of patients uh, would be basically either complete or partial tears that are non-retracted. So about two thirds or so of the existing surgical candidates. So this is a large case series that we published. We have a randomized controlled trial underway. Uh, this is some of the data from our treatment registry on osteoarthritis and rotator cuff tears, so 1,500 patients. This is the DASH, uh, which has been normalized that 100 is full function, uh, just so that all of these things on our website go the same direction so we're not confusing patients. And uh, this is uh, a partially completed randomized controlled trial that will hopefully be done by this year. Uh, again, a crossover with physical therapy and a one-to-one -one allocation. Uh, this, these are SANE scores, MPS, and DASH of physical therapy uh, verse it, versus a precise ultrasound-guided bone marrow concentrate injection directly into these tears. Uh, knee ACL tears. 
So again, as I said, with the rotator cuff stuff, uh, and I'll elaborate here a little further, uh, we break these into partial, meaning partial signal change on MRI, uh, full thickness signal change, but non-retracted, and full thickness retracted tears. Now, we can deal with the first two types uh, very well, but when it comes to full thickness retracted tears, that's not something that we can generally handle at this point. Uh, so this is published in ongoing data. So we have two MRI case series that have been published. Uh, and then again, we have a randomized controlled trial that will hopefully be done uh, this year, uh, very similar to the other trial. Again, uh, these are, are patients who are surgical candidates, meaning they have failed physical therapy, they failed test of time, they're still having significant pain and functional issues. Most of these would be complete non-retracted uh, patients. So this is a three-month MRI result. Uh, this is a younger woman from Singapore. So uh, it's good to be in your 20s because generally we'll see very rapid change in, that, uh, in those patients. And then these are the SANE, LEFS, and IKD uh, C scores uh, from that study of the physical therapy and the treatment groups. Uh, lumbar disc protrusion. Uh, so we have a technology that we developed that uses hypoxic culture expanded cells that's currently in uh, phase two FDA trials. These are two studies that were published on this uh, technology. And here we see these specially cultured cells into the disc bulge uh, to heal that disc bulge and reduce the size of the bulge without surgery. Um, and these were chronic bulges that were only minimally responsive to epidurals. They failed the test of time, and thus they were surgical candidates. So this is an uh, exemplar uh, type MRI. You can see there a pretty big bulge in the first two images on sagittal and axial, and then a resolution of that bulge uh, after the procedure. Uh, this is the reduction in bulge sizes, both pre and post treatment, to give you an idea of what that looks like across 30-some uh, patients and then the SANE scores from that same N equals 33 pilot study. So if you're interested in interventional orthopedics, uh, how do you get started? How should you be trained? Well, the dilemma is that sports and spine fellowships only get you part of the way there. A sports fellowship focuses on simple ultrasound guide injections of peripheral joints. Obviously, a spine fellowship focuses on fluoroguide guide injections of the spine, but really neither gives you much experience in orthobiologics, and you need both ultrasound and fluoro skills to do interventional orthopedics right. So we have three fellowship slots a year for full-time regen med that's focused uh, two-thirds clinical and one-third research, 50-50 between peripheral joints and spine, 100% orthobiologics, and our fellows have come from lots of important places uh, like Emory or right here at Stanford, uh, University of Texas, uh, UVM, uh, University of Alabama, Baylor, UCLA, etc. So uh, we're taking some very qualified residents, but we're only taking a small fraction of those that have the requisite skills so that at the end of a year, they know what it is they're doing with regard to fluoro and ultrasound in interventional orthopedics. Um, so are there other opportunities for training? Uh, thankfully, uh, billionaire John Malone, uh, who's a philanthropist, uh, gave us many millions of dollars to start the Interventional Orthopedics Foundation. And the focus there is we have 14 courses that cover all body areas and approximately 90 different image-guided interventional orthopedics procedures. This is a nonprofit, so residents and fellows can often get steeply discounted or free education, which is one of the great things about being a nonprofit, meaning no one's making any money off of this. The focus here is to get the job done. And we have an annual conference uh, that's coming up here in February that also provides grants for fellows and residents, so that fellows and residents can attend that free of charge. In fact, they can get a scholarship for their airfare, a scholarship for their hotel, because we want fellows and residents exposed to this now to
to understand where the future is headed. So we're all, where is all this stuff going? Uh, well, the big change that we're starting to see is that we can compete head to head with orthopedic surgery once we get insurance reimbursement, right? Because that's the big difference between these orthobiologic procedures now and what's done through orthopedic surgery. Uh, and we have done a fantastic job uh, so far of getting insurance coverage. So these are self-insured. Uh, we started doing this, collecting pilot cost savings data uh, at our Iowa network site in 2015. Uh, and we're up now to about 7 million covered lives. So that means that 7 million people in the United States who are insured through these companies have full coverage for orthobiologics procedures. And in many cases, there's many cases, there's steering language that puts the uh, interventional orthopedist in front of the surgical orthopedist, uh, meaning that if, if you can be helped through a non-surgical procedure, uh, that won't cost you anything. You'll get full coverage, no copay, no deductible. Uh, but if you choose the surgery, despite being told that a non-surgical option may work, then you've got to pay more. And that's all working because we're able to reduce elective orthopedic surgery rates and we're able to save these companies lots and lots of money, removing cases out of hospitals, out of ambulatory surgery centers, into offices, and we're taking them from surgical to percutaneous. Uh, again, these plans now have steering language and that goes something like this. Uh, bottom line is that your copay and deductible will be waived if you choose the non-surgical route. Now, what does that mean practically? What that means practically is obviously there's some cases we can't handle at all, handle at all. So uh, you're gonna get referred to a surgeon out of the, the gate if this is not something that interventional orthopedics can handle. But if it is something interventional orthopedics can handle, uh, and a percutaneous orthobiologic procedure is likely to work based on the collected registry or published data, then uh, you get your copay and deductible waived if you go that route. So here are my educated guesses for 2030. I don't know if this is 2030 or 2035 or 2040, but it's somewhere in there. Uh, We'll see more than a 50% reduction in elective orthopedic uh, joint, tendon, and ligament surgeries. Uh, we'll see a blended specialty. We'll see some orthopedic surgeons retraining and a lot of non-surgeon interventionalists. Uh, and we'll see orthobiologics coverage for many indications and more and more procedural devices. And again, this stuff is going to compete head to head with orthopedic surgery in the marketplace. And I believe it's gonna go the same way as interventional cardiology. When interventional cardiology competed head to head with surgical cardio or cardiovascular surgery, uh, more and more plans chose interventional cardiology simply because it was less invasive uh, and obviously saved huge costs over cardiovascular surgery. So in summary, um, autologous orthobiologics are here to stay. Uh, we've seen good results clinically based on registry and RCT data. Uh, we're continuing to do the hard research. And interventional orthopedics is about to change everything. Uh, so thanks so much for watching uh, and have a great day.